Well, good morning, everybody. Glad to see everybody here to this morning. We have uh, some cheery new faces here today, and we had our very first little snow this morning. What a what a wonderful thing that is to see it covers up all that dirt and all that nasty stuff. Kind of gives us a little bit of a fresh start. For those of you who are online today, we welcome you as well, and uh, we thank you for joining us here today. And uh, it is a beautiful day. It is the day that the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm Pastor Mark. Pastor Terry and Diane are out. They had uh, their daughter's wedding this weekend, and so uh, they're traveling today, and we wish them traveling mercies and, and a uh, joyful ride and a joyful weekend. Some blessed time with family this weekend. So today, we are going to be starting our week number five of I Still Believe on our sermon series, and uh, it is called You Are For Me, and it's about God's commitment to us. See, we're always called to make a commitment to God, but God has made a commitment to us, and this talks about what a wonderful promise and the things that we can stand on, our foundation that we can build our lives upon today. We have some great things coming up for Grace Street Church. Last week we had our orange track racing over here, and which uh, uh, we have one more session to do yet this year, and then uh, we wrap up the year. But we have uh, some wonderful things planned for Thanksgiving and Christmas, and we've got a great celebration coming up in our Advent series. Uh, Max Lucado's brand new study that uh, just came out, that is, You Are Never Alone. And so we look forward to that as well. Let us start off with our call to worship this morning, which comes from Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. And it talks about how Christ is our high priest. And when we think about that, we think back into biblical times, the high priests and prophets were the ones who prayed over you and delivered you and delivered God's message to you. And Christ is our living high priest. And so... It starts off, so then, since we have a great high priest who entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. The high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, and yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and find grace to help us when we need it most. And boy, isn't that a great foundation that we can stand upon. That promise, and we've talked about the promises of God now for the last five Sundays. And we've talked about the foundations that we can lay upon his word, the truth, and the commitment that God makes to us. And so as we wrap up this sermon series today, we're going to spend our final time in Romans 8, the very end of the chapter, and we're going to go through those things today. Let's start off right now with a word of prayer. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just come before you right now in honor and in glory of the commitment that you make to us, of the wonderful promises that you give us that we can live our lives out and that, Lord, no matter what we go through, no matter what testing we are, we are hit with, Lord, you're there. You're there with us each and every step of the way. And moreover, we don't have to worry about the future, Lord, because you're already there. And Jesus, you're sitting at the right hand of the Father. You're interceding for us today. No matter what we've done, no matter who we were, when we stand before you, Lord, our sins are washed away. And we praise you and thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that we can stand upon that promise. That no matter who we are, we are worthy with you, Lord, in our lives. Amen. So today we're going to start off our scripture reading with Romans 8, 31 through 39, right after the video clip. God's commitment to us is demonstrated because of his love, because it is unchanging, unreserved, and unconditional, we know that he is committed to us. In Romans 8, Paul describes the kind of committed love God has for us 
Starting in verse 31, Paul writes, If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son and gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? And so as Paul writes about God's committed love for us, Paul says in verse 32, If God is for us, who can be against us? Now look, if you just asked yourself the second half of that question, who can be against me? The answers could feel pretty overwhelming. You could even come up with a list, maybe a long list of who or what might be against you. But if that first part is true, if God is for us, it changes everything, puts everything else in perspective. So you might say, I've struggled with my health for so long, I feel like my body is against me. But God is for me. My kids are constantly fighting with each other, and I'm tired before the day even starts. But God is for me. My marriage, my finances, my fears, my failures, all those things at different times can feel like they're coming against me. But God is for me. And God is for you. It doesn't mean you won't face opposition. But it does mean that you don't have to be overwhelmed. It doesn't mean you won't deal with discouragement. But it does mean that you won't be defeated. I like that very last part that says, no matter what we face, no matter how discouraged we get in life, we, we know that we won't be defeated. See, that's the great blessing that we have in the scriptures is we already know what the outcome is going to be and we win. <laughs> so no matter what we face right now, it's just a, a temporary hurdle that we have to overcome because we have the promises of God that in the end we will be with him. And we have that great honor and glory to look forward to. So Romans 8, 31 through 39 is what we're going to base everything on today in our, in our message. And it says, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him, graciously give us all things. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? For as it is written, for your sake we shall face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now there is what we call a commitment, a total all-in by God. And that word is what we can build our foundation on. That word is what we can stand upon as we walk through our lives. And that big, bold statement that comes out of that is, you are for me. That is something that we have to receive into our hearts today. We have to take that message from God that no matter what we go through, no matter how hard it seems, God is for us. And if God is for us, who is bigger than God? No one. So then who can be against us? No one. And understanding that and, and taking that in, receiving it, and moreover, believing it is the key to happiness in your life. Commitment from God to us. And see, a lot of times we stumble with that. We, we, we have a real hard time. I know I've struggled with that on and off for years. Do you ever feel that salvation is for everybody but you? 
that you're not good enough? Well, see, these verses then are especially for you, for me, when we struggle. And I want you to think of God's commitment to you in this way, that you have this promise. You have this blessing, because it is a blessing. But we have to receive it, and we have to believe it in order for it to work in our lives. God made the commitment to us. We have to do the same thing. We have to have belief. We have to have faith. That's our part in the whole equation. We have to believe it and receive it. And we hear a lot of things about commitment these days. And this time of year, we hear about, you know, all these young athletes and pro athletes and everybody committing to go and play for a team. And, and oh yeah, yeah, it's election year, so. We hear about all these commitments that these politicians are going to make and all these promises that they're going to do for us. And if they, you know, if you vote for me, we're going to get into office and we're going to do all these things. And I don't care what party it is because it doesn't make a difference. You know, and unfortunately, many times these turn out to be just kind of hollow or simply untrue. Or say that athlete, he just decides he's going to move on to another team because he didn't get enough play time and it didn't build him up enough to where he thinks his career should go. See, and a lot of times we sink a lot of our effort and our time and our energies into those kind of commitments. But they can all turn out to be hollow or untrue. But amid these promises, we can still count on God to hold true to his commitments that he's made to us. Each one of us, he makes that commitment to. And that reality looks like this. If God gave his son for you, he isn't going to hold back that gift of salvation from you. If God gave his son for you, he certainly is not going to hold back the things that would help you all in your life. And if Christ died for you, he isn't going to turn around and condemn you. He certainly won't hold anything back that you need to fulfill the life to live for him. Have you ever thought about it that way? Kind of turn the tables a little bit. But if Christ died for us, he isn't going to turn around and hold things back from us. He's going to make sure that we succeed in our lives. But again, we have to receive that. And we have to believe that. As we enter into our message today, we need to understand that these passages in the book of Romans that we've been studying here for the last five weeks, they're more than just a, a theological explanation of God's redeeming grace. It's more than just a bunch of theologians saying, hey, this is, these are really neat. What it is, really, it's a letter that Paul wrote to the Romans who were entering into a time of terrible persecution and even to death for being Christians. It's a letter of confidence and comfort, and it's addressed to us all, even us today. It's an explanation of God's grace and mercy. And it's his assurance and his commitment to us all that he is going to be with us every day of our life in all of our trials. And it's not that we won't have that testing going on. We talked about that a few weeks ago. And boy, I'll tell you what, I preached the sermon on Sunday and I lived it out all week long. It was just like, oh, you want to know what testing is all about? Well, let me show you. And I did. I lived it out all week long. And, and it's kind of that way as we go through life. We're going to be tested. But in the midst of all these things, we need to make sure that we rely on God and not ourselves. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. We need to have faith in the face of trials. We need to have faith that he's going to bring us through those trials. He's going to see us through no matter what. That's his commitment to us. And it's an unfailing commitment. And there's a lot of people who worry about things that we just simply cannot change. Things that God has already got covered for us and we're worrying about it. 
We're worried about what tomorrow's going to bring, but see, we don't need to worry about the future because Jesus is already there and he's interceding on our behalf each and every day. He has it covered. So we don't need to worry. We don't need to take on those additional stresses in our life. We need to have faith. We need to receive and believe. And those are kind of the theme words for today, if you kind of notice. We need to receive it and believe it. And that's the key to having a successful life. So when we look further on into verse 34, Paul says in the letter that Jesus is pleading for us in heaven. God has acquitted us and removed our sin and guilt through Jesus' sacrifice for us. And so it's not God, it's Satan. It's Satan that accuses us, not God. God's not waiting to strike us down because, see, he just got done giving us salvation, giving us the path to eternal life. We have to receive that and believe it. He's not waiting to strike us down with his wrath. But the nice thing is we have that commitment from God. We've got Jesus who's up there interceding on our behalf. When Satan comes against us, Jesus is our advocate. He sits at God's right hand to present our case. To present our case. And if God is for us, who can be against us? I hope that settles into your heart because that's a key to having a long and successful life in Christ. And a lot of us struggle who who God is. And as I was going through the sermon last night and we had just got done eating dinner and, you know, some things were just clicking in my head. And so I, I looked at Lori and I said, well, I'm going to be up a while tonight. I got some rewrite to do. And so I went back and I reviewed the entire sermon for this morning. And I, I was thinking to myself, I'm going, you're just not making the point that God wants you to make. And he was talking to me about it. And see, a lot of times in life we struggle with who God is and what we think he's like. And so it brings us to that level of uncertainty that I was talking about earlier. And I hope by the time we get done with this message today that we can dispel that uncertainty. We can dispel the things that would hold us back from receiving and believing the word of God taking it into our hearts and living it out day by day. And that's what I was going through last night. I was going, okay, okay, I'm not, I'm not getting the point across. I gotcha. So a few years ago, one of the most popular apps to hit the phones on the market was this game called Pocket God. And I don't know if you guys have heard this one or not. I, I'm, I'm not the one who has all the time, and I don't usually play video games and those kind of things. So, you know, I'm probably not the best, best authority on it, but we have uh, some sermon outlines that we were given for this series of I Still Believe, and, and so I kind of went through this thing and it was talking about pocket God. And, uh, you know, I, I, I built it into the sermon outline and... <laughs> I got to share this with you because as I read this thing, I was, I was just shaking my head with disbelief. But really, truly, it makes a great point. It really brings home a point. So a few years ago, one of those most popular apps was called Pocket God. And, you know, maybe if you're like me, you're kind of embarrassed to say it, but I don't know anything about it, so I guess I'm way behind the times. But either way, it was a very popular game, and it was advertised out this way. What kind of God would you be? And if we stop to think about it, it's an interesting question. Then, the, then this app goes on to tell you about what you can do in the game and that you're this all-powerful God over this group of primitive islanders. And according to the advertisement, you can have hours of fun giving life and then taking it away. Whoa! Just as easily as you give it, you can take it away. And so in just a few minutes on the app, it's pretty clear that the creators of this game came to the table with some preconceptions 
about the nature and the character of God, who he is and who God is to them. And I thought we might just play along with us a little bit this morning and, and hypothetically for a few moments. So you're God over this island and you can create life. So with one swipe, you created the life and you can also control the weather and you can make it very hot if you're a little mad that day and you know make it uncomfortable for for your little islanders there that you are the god over and so you can watch them break out to this you know sweat and struggle to make it through the day and struggle to get by and then you can make it really cold as well so you can sit there and you can watch as your little people start to freeze a bit and then there's a lot of things that you can do on pocket god you can feed the people to the sharks yeah yeah <laughs> you can shake the island and turn it into an earthquake but what is entering interesting if, if we look at all the possibilities that these guys build into this game that as far as i can tell the only things you can do to the people are bad things are bad things there wasn't anything good in there outside of creating them, I guess. But the only things you can do is bad things. And so the whole idea of the game is to be a God who is cruel and vindictive and cold and mean and out to get everybody else. And there's this sense in which, depending upon how you grew up in your life yourself, you know, and what you were taught, you can have some pretty strong preconceived notions about who God is as well. But as you can see from the game that they developed in here, they've got kind of a jaded idea of who God is and what God is all about. Feeding people to sharks is probably not something God wants to do. At least not the God that I serve and hopefully not the God that you serve. But see, as I was growing up as a kid, I can remember you know, some of the hellfire and brimstone sermons and hearing that we were supposed to fear God. And I grew up to do just that. I was afraid of God. I figured, hey, one misstep and it's all over. The wrath of God's going to strike you down. And maybe for you, when you think of God, the words that play over and over again are the ones that are, God's going to be out to get me. God's against me. In a way, it becomes your reality of who God is. And then that leads you to think that you're never going to be good enough for God. Wow. I struggled with that for several years. And back when I was a teenager, I had, uh, we had gone to a, a youth camp and, and uh, had a great pastor that was there at the youth camp. And uh, he had me read some scripture one day, and he says, you know, you've got a great way in reading scripture. He says, you've got a voice that's made for radio and things, and later on in life, I did do radio. But he said, the way that you read the scriptures, you bring them to life. And I got to thinking, he says, you know, I think God is calling you to go into the ministry. And I'm going, me? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> he must be talking about the other guy. See, I was not good enough to be called into the ministry. But see, God has a commitment for our lives. He equips us to do what we need to do, what he calls us to do. So whether we think we're good enough or not, we are good enough. God made that commitment. Because if God is for us, who can be against us? And unfortunately, a lot of times, it seems to be ourselves. Ourselves. We tend to play ourselves down to the point to where we think we're not going to be good enough to serve a massive, big God like that. I've done stuff wrong in my life. He couldn't want to use me. No, you got through the bad things in your life because God was with you and God brought you through them. 
So if that became your reality, and if you think that God's not good enough for you, I want you to go back and I want you to review these verses in Romans. Because in these verses, Paul challenges regarding the commitment of God. God's commitment to us. Paul's going to change that perception of who God is from being a spiteful God instead to being an actuality, a loving, caring, and accepting God. And let's be honest with each other from the get-go. It's going to be hard for some of us to hear the first time we hear it. And many of us, because of the circumstances that we're going through in life right now, and maybe what you thought about and what you were taught growing up is standing in the way of looking in that commitment and believing it and receiving it into your heart today. But I want to tell you that these verses that Paul wrote to those people to that church in Rome as they were going through this persecution and they were going through this struggle was to bring them through that struggle, the same kind of struggle that we might be going through in our lives today. Believe it and receive it and free yourself from the bondage of being separated from God, from a loving God's going to show us his love, and I hope we'll understand it. And moreover that, we will take and we'll see that love and this commitment in a whole new way by the time we're done today with this message. See, because that whole theme in, in Romans is nothing can separate us from God's love. That is the truth. That is the truth that we need to receive. He says, what should we say about such wonderful things as this? If God is for us, then who can ever be against us? Don't let it be you. Since he did not even spare his own son, but God gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Let that speak to your heart today. Who dares accuse us from whom God has chosen to be his own? No one, for God himself has given us Right standing with himself. Right standing. When we stand for God, the moment that we stand for God and we say, yes, God, I believe you and I receive you. At that point in time, his grace and his mercy showers over us. And sin is washed away. Our past is washed away. The bad stuff in our life is washed away. Don't go back and collect the dirty water and bring it back. You're clean. In God's eyes, you're clean. And you're saved. And you're redeemed. The minute you stand up for God and say you believe. The minute you stand up. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised for life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us, interceding for us. See, God knows our hearts and he knows our nature and he knows that, you know, even though he's forgiven us, we're still going to sin. We're still going to sin. But he's got that covered. Jesus is there interceding for us, pleading for us, going, hey, give him another shot. Give them another chance. They're still good. And I've got it covered. Yeah. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Wow. These are some powerful questions that Paul's got in this message. Does it mean that he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger? Or threatened with death. You know it says in the scripture there. That for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. And then he follows it up. He says no. Despite all these things. Overwhelming victory is ours. Through Christ Jesus. Who loves us. Believe it. And receive it. 
and be freed from the chains. See, we all kind of chain ourselves down by not feeling that we're worthy. He goes on to say, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor either fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing at all in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, if nothing ever in your entire life screams commitment, this should do it. This should do it. But if you notice what it's all centered on, it's centered upon God's love, on the love of Jesus Christ. And what does that mean? Well, as Paul writes this, you can just hear this sense of urgency in his voice. He's desperate to help those people understand more completely about that avid love of God. And I want to call it an avid love of God. I want to put that in there so you understand that it's a love that's on fire. A love that's never ending. A love that is true, real, and genuine. That love that Christ has for us is unending, and it's unconditional. So if we take a look at these things, there's a, there's a lot of different words that Paul could have used to describe love. And see, for us, love becomes a generalized term in our lives. But that avid love, that God has for us. I want you to hold on to that term, that avid love. Because I think if we understand how steadfast the love of God is, it's a game changer. It changes things. It changes things. But it can be difficult for us to really understand the love of God because of that word, love. See, it's become just a little bit tainted in our society today. It's been cheapened down somewhat. And if you think about the way that we use the word love throughout the course of a week, then you can realize that pretty quickly what I'm trying to say here is that word love kind of gets kind of watered down, if you will. And it's too bad that Pastor Terry isn't here today because he would have special appreciation for the next point, being an ardent Pepsi fan. We have this little running gun show between Coke and Pepsi with us. So. But I've heard people explain their great love for Coke and for Diet Coke from McDonald's. Yep, from McDonald's. And some people have whole theories about how Coke and Diet Coke taste better if you go to McDonald's and get it from their machines. That's right. There's entire websites that are dedicated and committed to that movement. And so you might hear someone see, say, well, I love Diet Coke from McDonald's. Sorry, Terry, Pepsi wasn't involved. I love Diet Coke from McDonald's. Hmm. Or someone might say, I love that new pair of boots I just got. Or I love a pillow top mattress because, oh, it's so comfortable. And my grandson might say to me, well, Grandpa, I love Jello," Or I love fill in the blank. And then they turn around and they say, well, I love Jesus. Or God loves me. And so it becomes confusing. It becomes kind of diluted. And that's because we use that word love as a generalization to describe so many different things in our lives. And here's what's interesting. As, as Paul writes to us about the love of God, he has a number of different words in, that he could use at his disposal. And, and for those of you who know that Paul was a, uh, spoke Greek, and he was an educated person. So in the Greek, 
uh, there is a number of words that describe love. And so I want to go through a few of those today, and, and I want you to listen for what these words mean, and so you understand what I'm talking about when we talk about God's love versus that term love that we use each and every day. He could have chosen the word Greek eros, which is a love that's based upon feelings. And typically it's used in the context of a romantic or a sensual type relationship, but it's really a love that's an emotional love. And see, for most of us, that's how most of us think of when we hear that word love, is it's tied to emotions somehow. And really because it's tied to emotions, we really can't control it. And this is the kind of love that many of us seen as we were growing up, where maybe your parents, well, maybe they had fallen out of love. They didn't mean to, it just happened to them. And so having this kind of idea of love might be somewhat circumstantial, being based on what's happening around us and being based on conditions. So we look at that type of love as being a conditional love. So Paul could have used that term for love, but he didn't. He could have used the word philia, and philia is a love that's based on mutual benefits and commonality. And it's a good and it's a positive word, and it describes love, and typically in the context of a friendship or brother type, brother-sister type relationship that you might have, it communicates a certain amount of loyalty. It com communicates faithfulness with one another. And that's the same word that Paul uses later on in the chapter in Romans 12 to describe the kind of love that he wants us as a church to have for one another. This kind of brotherly love, you may have heard it called before. But that kind of love can also be a love that is dictated as well. In other words, it can be kind of this quid pro quo type love uh, where you love because of what you do for me and because what I might do for you. So you're gonna love me because of that type of condition. So we love each other because of what we do for each other. And should we stop doing X or Y or whatever it happens to be, then I'm going to stop loving you. And we see that happen in relationships today. And then another word that Paul could have used is agape. And agape is a love that is selfless, sacrificial, and unconditional. It's a love that's not based on those conditions that I just talked about. It has no expiration date. It doesn't become anything other than an unconditional love. It doesn't come with a list of requirements. It's a commitment that's unshakable. And it's a love that loves even when there's nothing offered in return. It's a love that's not tied to circumstance. So would you care to guess which kind of love, which kind of word that Paul uses in Romans 8 here in these to describe God's love for us? Yeah, you got it right. You bet. Agape. He's, up, he's down here. He's signing to me here. He's spelling it all out. Agape love. And it's the same word that we read in John 3, 16 that, that's used there. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. When he's conveying us to there is the love of God, is a love that is selfless, sacrificial, and unconditional. The problem for us is when it comes to this kind of love, and we try and tie it to belief and faith, we have a tough time because it's hard for us to accept an unconditional love, a selfless love, one that's given completely and totally without strings attached. It's unconditional. 
There's no circumstance. There's no quid pro quo. And so it's kind of hard for us to say, yeah, well, I accept that. I'll take that love. Because we truly don't understand it because we typically throughout our lives have not lived out that type of unconditional, selfless love. But that is the love that God has for us. And we don't see it. And if we don't see it, we don't receive it. And then we don't believe it. Because it's not something that we've truly experienced in the past. And we have a really, really hard time trying to relate to it. So because of that, we are not changed or challenged by it. And what happens then? Well, maybe I'm not worthy of that type of love. And we start to doubt. See, but that unconditional, selfless love, that agape love that comes without any strings attached, is there for us to receive and believe in. And that's the kind of love that God has for us. And one of the realities that most of us have is we have not experienced that agape love here on earth. And I don't want to seem like I'm trying to be overly depressing or anything at all, but I just want you to think of, of one thing for a moment. And maybe this will become very clear to you then. Why did the people in your life love you? Why did the people in your life love you? Why do they love you? Chances are that almost everyone in your life and in my life, they love us because. And we have that neat little because thing. And there's a because in that phrase, right? We always look for some kind of justification. So some of you love because you're cute or you're funny or because you're successful or they love you because you love them. They love you because you're related. Sometimes that's a tough one. And you don't really feel like it. you have a choice. <laughs> so you gotta love them. And there's often this because type of love that we've just kind of grown accustomed to it. Now, if you don't believe me, I want you to go down to your local Hallmark or card store, whichever one you want to, and on the front of that cover, you're going to find a message that has a type message of, you know, I love you on it. And then you open it up, and it'll say, because, because, dot, 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 whatever it happens to be. So based on what it's termed causality, or a cause and effect relationship, I love you because of this. And so it's... It's a reason why we feel emotionally, remember that one? Why we feel that we love someone is because of something. Because of something. So that means that there's got to be strings attached, right? Now, is that the kind of good love that God has for us? No strings attached. It's agape love. It's unconditional love. There's no because. So here's the reasons why you're getting this card. Because of dot, dot, dot. And so we think that in order to have love, there has to be something that causes that love to happen. On the surface, it can be very, very sweet, but really if we think about it, it becomes very selfish. And here's the reason for the card that says, I love you. And um, here's the reason for what you do for me is why I love you. And on the surface, it's kind of neat, but underneath you're going, well, that's it. There's no more. Is that all there is to love? I know, a little cheesy. But what if the because stops being reality. 
Hmm. What about that? What if the because stops being a reality in your life? Wow. What if someone loves you because you're beautiful? Well, that works for a while, right? Right? But eventually, beauty fades. What if someone loves you because you're funny? And then they marry you, and they find out you're equally funny and annoying. Hi, hon. What happens when someone marries you because you're successful, and then you fail? What happens when the because changes? Does the love change as well? Does the commitment start to feel like something worth breaking at that point? Remember that causality, that cause and effect, the circumstances and conditions, they'll never equal true love because true love is un conditional love. That's the kind of love that God has for us. There's no because. There's no conditions. There's no causality. There's no cause and effect. What we find when we study the love of God that love is in its purest form because of no because. God loves you. Period. God loves you. Period. And that's so hard for us to accept based on our past experience. We want to think that it's something that we can do to control it or to earn his love or to deserve his love. But there is no because. And if you insist on having because, you could just put it to yourself this way. Notice I said put it to yourself this way. God loves you because he loves you. How's that one? God loves you because he loves you. Yeah. It's as hard as that, and it's as simple as that. It's as hard as that, and it's as simple as that. And some of you need to hear this because of your pre preconception of who God is. Not this kind of love. You grew up being taught that God would love you more if you did something or if you didn't do something. I remember a Sunday school teacher telling us that. God will love you more if you come to church every Sunday and you sit in the pew every Sunday. But see, that's not true. There is no condition to God's love. I'd like it if you came here more often and if you sat in the pews more often. But it wouldn't change the love that I have for you any less. And that's the kind of love that God has. That's the kind of love that God has. Yeah. God doesn't love that way, and that's hard for us. And oftentimes we've been faced with a lot of guilt and shame in our relationship for God. And as a result, we think that what we do or what we don't do determines his love for us. But see, God doesn't love you any more if you've ever been addicted to drugs than if you hadn't, or if you've ever slept around, or if you had, or if you've ever had an abortion, or if you hadn't. He doesn't love you more than the people who've done all those things. He doesn't love you more because you dress modestly or because you live humbly. He doesn't love you more because you scored the most points on a team, or because you sang the solo in church, or because you're a great leader, or because you're a gifted teacher. Things do not determine God's love for you. So this week, I, I posted a slide up on my Facebook site, and I, I tend to do this when God says, here's an epiphany, and take a look at it. So I've got a slide of it here for me. Uh, hopefully you can read it, but I'll read it off to you. There is no perfect life. There is no perfect job, no perfect childhood, no perfect marriage, no perfect set of people who will always do what we expect them to do. But what we do have 
We have a perfect God who is able to lead us through this imperfect life with unfailing strength, incomparable wisdom, and infinite love. Infinite love. That avid love I was talking about today. This is what it's all about. He is there unconditionally loving us. No strings attached. With an incomparable wisdom and infinite love. So in the near future here, we're going to show the movie The Shack. And last Saturday when Lori and I came back from wedding uh, to our hotel in Rochester, I uh, kind of surprised her. and I had the movie downloaded on my little Microsoft Surface and we, we laid there in, in bed and we watched the movie The Shack together. And I got to tell you, it's a game changer. It's a game changer. Your notions about who God is will be put to the test. I can't wait to show it to you. And here's the reality. It's all level here. And there's not one person in the room that has done something to make God love him or her more than anyone else. And it's kind of a tough, tough movie to see at first because it actually challenges, challenges us on our preconceived notions of who God is or what God will do. And it's, it's a different type of movie. And, and I struggled with this. I read the book years ago and I was just kind of going, well, this isn't quite what I thought. And then I watched the movie and it, it's not exactly what the book says, but it really challenges us to think about God in a different vein. And I think that's truly what the author was after. Kind of like what Paul is doing here. And it's not how the love of God works. It is who God is in our life and what he is doing in our lives. If we receive it and believe it. And that is, that is the key to what they're saying in the movie. So we have to receive God into who we are. We have to live it out in our life, not our preconceived notions, not who we think God might be based on our past experiences, but because of his unconditional love for us. He loves you because he loves you. D.A. Carlson describes God love in this way. He says, Picture Charles and Susan walking down the beach hand in hand at the end of an academic year. They kicked off their sandals and the wet sand squishes through their toes and Charles turns to Susan, gazes deeply into her hazel eyes and says, Susan, I love you. I really do. So what does he mean when he says, I love you? Well, according to D.A. Charles, he, he may Carson, you may think something like this. Your, your smile takes my breath away. I love your sense of humor, your beautiful eyes, the scent of your hair. Everything about you transfixes me. I love you. And Carson goes on to say, what he certainly does not mean is something like this. Susan, quite frankly, you have such a bad case of halitosis, it would embarrass a large herd of unwashed garlic-eating elephants. So greasy is your hair that it could oil an 18-wheeler. And your nose is so bulbous, you belong in the cartoons. Your knees are so disjointed, you make a camel look elegant. I love you. He doesn't mean that, so D.A. Carson goes on to say, and this is him, not me, so I'm quoting him directly. What he does mean is when God says, I love you, He means something like this. You mean everything to me. I can't live without you. Your personality, the witty conversation, your beauty, your smile, everything about you transfixes me. Heaven would be boring without you. I love you. And this is what God means because to a degree, it has been our therapeutic approach to God. And in fact, when you hear God's love talked about, 
it's often with that idea in mind, that God loves us because you're special, because of what you bring to the table, and that's the approach that many of us have to God's love. But it's not the intended message that God has for us. And what we do is not indicative of his commitment for us and to us. And here's what he's saying. D.A. Carson goes on to write that morally speaking, you are the people of halitosis, the bulbous nose, the greasy hair, the disjointed knees. Your sins have made you disgustingly ugly, but I love you anyway, despite all these things. Not because you're attractive, not because you earned it, not because you deserve it. I love you because I love you. And you have to love being loved by that. It has the power to change everything. And here's the deal, though. You have always been loved like that. God has loved you like that. From before you were born. Unconditionally. And it comes down to whether you will receive it and whether you will accept it or not. Whether you believe it and whether you will have faith in that unconditional love that God has. This is how God loves us. So Paul knows the difference that can make when he really, really wants so desperately for those people, us, to have their eyes open and embrace this kind of love that is deeply committed, regardless of what we have done and regardless of what might come our way. In verse 31, he says, What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? And that phrase right there, who can be against us? Maybe if you question it on its own, you could find a list or you could feel like, as he said in the introductory video, that our finances might be against us. We have casual acquaintances that are no longer friends that could be against us. And it could be that maybe you're feeling like nobody or nothing is committed to you. But right now, and really in light of that, you aren't really feeling like you're going to be committed either. But what Paul says is this, if God is for us, who really can be against us? And that final section in Romans 8 begins with that question of what should we say in response to this? He's pointing back to what we studied last week with Pastor Terry, and that in all things, God works together for the good of those who loved him and are called according to his purpose. So look, if God works in all things together for good, what shall we say in response to that? Nothing can be against us because God is for us. James 1, 2 through 5 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may mature and be complete, not lacking in anything. But if you lack wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. God is all in for you. God is loyal, steadfast, faithful, completely committed, and generously giving to us so that we would not be lacking in anything. In other words, when things come against us, God receives it. He catches it. He takes it. He makes it into something good and then sends it back our way. No matter how bad it feels, no matter how bad it seems, God takes it, receives it, changes it, makes it into good and sends it back our way. What do we have to do? We have to receive that from God. 
We have to have the faith and belief that God is for us and that he is doing all things for our good. If we try and insert reason or causality or because into the equation, when we try and get an immediate answer to the situation we face in a trial, we always want to know why, why? But see, that's not the point. God isn't in it for the why. God's looking into the future. He's interested in the what. What will you do with what I am challenging you with today? What will you do with this trial? And usually in my life it's been, he puts me through something so that later in life I can relate to somebody else who's going through the exact same thing. He equips us to do his work through others and in others. If we believe it and we receive it and we accept it. God is more concerned with the purpose, not the reason. The what, not the why. The long term versus the immediate. The preparation for the future, not punishment for the present. True, unconditional love that transcends time. That's the kind of power and sovereignty that God has. That in all things good or bad, all things that come against us, if he takes it and works it for good, what then and who then can be against us? Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for the blessing of your message today. Thank you, Lord, that you gave us a brand new beginning today. A fast start, a fresh start. Lord, we stand before you today and we receive your grace and your mercy that showers us like rain. That washes away the sins of our past. No matter who we were, no matter what we've done, Lord, your love is greater than all these things. And the moment that we stand up for you, Lord, our sins are washed away. We are reborn in you because of your unselfish, your unlimited love for us. Lord, help us to bring others to this understanding of your unlimited love, of your grace and your mercy so that we can share with them the life that you have planned for them, that we can be your hands and feet here to reach out to others, to show them this unconditional love without any because. Thank you, Lord, for your gift of your son, Jesus, for the blessings you give us each and every day. Thank you, Father God, in your precious name we pray. So as we come to our time in our service here for communion, let us remember the sacrifice that Jesus made out of his unconditional love. God gave his son unconditionally for us to save us of our sins, to give us salvation, to give us redemption. No matter who we are, no matter what we've done, God has got redemption for us. We need to receive it. We need to believe it. And we need to accept it today. So on the night that Jesus was given up, he took bread and he broke it. And he said to the disciples, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Likewise, later in the meal, he took a cup, and after he had blessed it, he said, This is the blood of the new covenant, my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And each time that you take of this bread and drink of this cup, do it in remembrance of me. body of Christ broken for you. The 
the blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. Now we come to a time in our service where we have prayers for the people, or what we call our agape time. And our agape time is our opportunity to give back to those who may be struggling uh, to talk about God's grace and mercy that we've seen in God incidents in our life this week. And uh, I've got something to be very thankful for. Dad's here this today, and he went through his surgery and got uh, everything out okay, and he's doing quite well. And we're happy for that, although he didn't have heat last night. We'll fix that today. And uh, it's wonderful to see our friend Bruce here. Uh, Bruce lost his wife a week ago, and we're so happy to see him here and have him join with us today. So uh, thank you for that, Bruce, and, and it's wonderful to see you, brother. We love you. Are there other, other things we need to lift up today? I'd like to lift up travel mercies for Steve and Denise as they're traveling, uh, going down to see his mother and his brother. Uh, who are struggling with some health problems themselves, and Pastor Terry and Diane will be traveling back to Cedar Rapids today, so we want to lift them up as well and uh, bless them. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, whose love is big enough to surround this entire earth. Lord, who you, your love is so unconditional. Your love is everlasting to everlasting. Help us to receive it today. Help us to believe it today and to live it each and every day of our lives. Help us to get through our preconceived notions of who you are and what you do and to understand that you are a loving God and that you've loved on each one of us as we go through the trials that we face each and every day in our lives. We thank you for the blessings that come in the birth of a, of a new granddaughter and in and the uh, health and the cure of a, of a parent and Lord for the sustaining of families who are struggling with health issues who are struggling with loss of jobs and loss of life Lord we lift them up to you today and to your care and comfort and we claim the victory in your name for their lives for their lives Lord that that you will come into their hearts today and let them know that you are here and that you are near and all they need to do is call out to you. And you will give them the blessings that you have for them. Thank you, Father God, for all these things. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. And this concludes our on-air portion of our service today. We thank you for joining us, and hopefully you'll join us again next week. And we'll be in, hopefully, a full crowd again next week. And Pastor Terry will be back. Uh, thanks again, and hope to see you again soon.